Okay, so let's start the last talk of this workshop, actually, uh, by Eric Lindgren um, from Uppsala. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who is going to talk on the notoriously hard problem of infinity harmonic functions? So the title is Infinity Harmonic Potential in Convex Rings. Please. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank the organizers of this. Um, workshop and also from the whole program for, for letting me stay here and they provide great working environment and everything is so efficient and streamlined so you can even you know wash your clothes here while you work so uh, I mean it's, it's just great um, okay so so what I'm going to talk about here is, is based on joint work with Peter Linquist who's in Norway and I think we'll see many nice talks here many nice results but actually in my talk you're not going to see so many nice results it, i'm going to more percent what i don't understand and what we didn't succeed in improving um, so it's more more that approach um, <clears throat> so i'll to talk i will start a little bit with an introduction to the infinite notation because not maybe everyone uh, is maybe not well acquainted with this operator spend a little time on the main results Hopefully, I have time to discuss um, the proofs and also the specific case of the square, which is already there. I think it's kind of fascinating and not so easy to understand. Um, okay, right. So the infinity Laplacian, Laplacian is this operator. So it's basically the second derivative in the direction uh, of the gradient. And there are some people that use the same notation where they normalize um, with the absolute, with the norm of the gradient square divide by that. Um, but okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to this convention. So written in coordinate form, it's just this operator. So it's highly nonlinear, as you can see. Um, and if you look at solutions of this equation, this is what I will call infinity harmonic functions. And um, I will also motivate this motivation a little bit for those who haven't seen it before. Um, so this equation was discovered uh, by a Swedish mathematician, Gunnar Aronson, in the 60s, and he was studying this in connection to Lipschitz extensions, and, and there is a very strong uh, connection to the problem of extending Lipschitz functions with this equation. Um, so one approach which Aronson actually uh, took is to, um, to start looking at p-harmonic functions. So p-harmonic functions is what you get if you minimize this energy here, so the LP norm of the gradient, and let's say you fix the boundary data on, on a domain, uh, omega, and then you minimize this among all functions that have the same boundary data. So if you take the first variation of this, you end up with this equation here, which is just called the p-laplace equation. And as you can see, um, if you put p equals to 2, well, then you just minimize gradient 2 squared, and you will have harmonic functions. So these functions are called p harmonic functions. So then you <coughs> might think, OK, we're, we're talking about infinity harmonic fun functions, probably he's going to send p to infinity. Yes. Um, so what would happen here if you would send p to infinity? Well, probably the limit function would minimize the infinity norm, if you just take the pth root of this as well, and we'll solve some sort of limit to me equation. So yeah, that's indeed the case. So I'm not doing any proofs here, I'm just saying like formally you would expect, so you have minimizers of the LP norm, that will converge to minimizers of the infinity norm. And if you expand this equation, so remember, so the p Laplacian is just the divergence of this thing here. So if you expand this in two terms, you get what is written here. And then formally, really hand-waving, but you can make this rigor rigorous, uh, if you send p to infinity, what will be left is this part here. So how do you know that the derivative of u is not zero? No, I mean, I don't know anything at this point, and I'm not claiming to know anything, but, um, so... It's still to obtain that, okay. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, I'm just saying that formally, if you expand the, the operator, um, it looks like this term will be dominating in the limit. And it's not so hard. I mean, if you do it, but you have to do it for viscosity solutions, and then you can actually see that this is what's going to happen. Um, okay, so, so it seems to be reasonable to believe that the limit function will minimize the infinity norm among functions coinciding on the omega, and will solve this equation um, at the limit. But if we go back a little bit uh, and see that we can actually, um, since we have minimizers of the Alpine norm or the gradient, and this is an additive function, right, when it comes to set, so it will be a minimizer in every subset of omega 2 of the Alpine norm gradient. Um, so this, however, is not additive in that sense, right? But if we take a u inside omega, so then this u we have before passing to the limit would be a minimizer in any subset of omega. So in fact, uh, in the end, this minimization property would hold on any subdomain of omega too, which is important. What is the corresponding boundary condition that you use? I mean, you can refer to the boundary for the global object. When you start doing interior, what are you comparing? So you, you're comparing, so it's the same, actually. I mean, it's not, this is no proof, but I'm saying, so, so you will have the same minimization property on every subdomain. So you take the, the Lipschitz norm or the gradient on the boundary of u, let's say, and then you minimize among all functions. This um, an infinity norm or the gradient inside. But, but if you fix a boundary Yeah, you fix the boundary conditions. So yeah. You fix the boundary conditions on omega. You don't control the boundary condition for that family as p varies. No, I mean, of course, you don't really do that. But if you, I mean, if you fix a subdomain, um, so this is what's going to happen, but there's no proof. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, so this was this was noticed by Olson. Uh, however, didn't really at that time have the sort of proper machinery to treat this equation, um, as I will mention a little bit more about later. And this was more uh, made rigorous by Battaglia di Benedetto and Manfredi in '89, where they proved um, that this limit actually holds. Um, Okay, and if you look at the last slide, so we were minimizing the gradient, the infinite norm of the gradient. So it seems quite related to minimizing the Lipschitz norm of a function, right? It's not exactly the same, but it looks kind of similar. So let me say a few words about Lipschitz extension. So this is about that you have a given function, which is Lipschitz, on some, um, let's say, closed set. In this case, I'm always going to think of a boundary of a domain, but this is not necessary to define the problem. Um, so a Lipschitz <coughs> extension of such a function g, defined on the boundary of the set omega, is, set to <coughs> is a function who has the least possible Lipschitz norm. So this is the Lipschitz norm over omega of u, and this is the Lipschitz norm of g on the boundary. And of course, if it coincides with g on the boundary, uh, yeah, I um, actually haven't said that it should coincide with G on the boundary, but it should, because otherwise, of course, you can take it to be zero, so, or constant. Um, so, of course, if it coincides with G on the boundary, you can't expect to have a lower Lipschitz bound um, than what G has. So, the optimal Lipschitz norm you, you may have is the Lipschitz norm of G. Uh, so, this problem, probably people have seen before, and does not have a unique uh, solution in general. So. It's very easy to draw in a very simple example. Uh, okay, this. <clears throat> so let's say we have this is minus one, this is the origin, and this is plus one. And let's suppose that we put the values one, uh, zero. So these two points are fixed. This is the boundary data, and then we want to find um, a Lipschitz extension of this function. So here in between, it has to go like that. Just that Lipschitz norm uh, at most one, because you have distance one and height one. Um, <clears throat> but here, I mean, you can take this function. It's not going to affect the Lipschitz norm, right? You can take a function with slope 1 or a function with minus 1 and then changing the slope of course so that it hits this point and anything in between here that doesn't have 
too steep uh, slope will be a Lipschitz extension. And in fact, any Lipschitz extension will lie in between those two. And these are, uh, there is always a maximal one and a minimal one, which are usually called the mesh. So these are two different examples? Oh, uh, three different examples. So one, I mean, so the Lipschitz norm of the boundary data is one. So what is the what is the domain? Oh, so, so okay. So we think the boundary is minus one, zero, and plus one. So the domain is this and this. Oh, okay. So it's not okay. It's disconnected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, I mean, the Lipschitz norm is one, so you can't have slope larger than one, but you can have anything that's in between. So it's fairly easy to see that in general you don't have any. So the maximal and the minimal are called the McShane and Whitney extensions. Um, okay, but then so people started thinking is there a way to sort of choose, choose a canonical Lipschitz extension? So if you look at this problem, maybe you'd think that maybe this one is the one you're actually looking for. Uh, but it depends on your taste, I guess. But, so one way of doing this is to require that this is a Lipschitz extension on any subdomain as well. And then it turns out to be unique. Um, so, so there is a connection with Lipschitz extensions and the infinity of Um <clears throat> So if you solve this equation, infinity of Hausner equation in a set, and then you have the boundary data G, the sage Lipschitz, then it turns out there is a Lipschitz extension of the boundary data, and in fact, it's also a Lipschitz extension on any subdomain of this set. And that's what people call AMLE, so absolutely minimizing Lipschitz extension is a long word for, for that property. Um, so, this was proved by Aronson um, for the first time for C2 functions. Um, uh, but in general, I mean, these this solutions are not C2. So then there have been different people proving different implications of this. I will, I will maybe mention a little bit later who did what. Um, okay, so, so what are the other properties that can be useful to know? So, um, so classical solutions is not a good notion of solutions. So this Gunnar Arnason already realized in the 60s, and what he, his argument for that was that if you take the unit ball and you take the boundary data, which is just x times y, so x and y are the two variables in the plane. Um, <coughs> so then he proved, in fact, that if you have a classical solution, then it's unique. But if you have a classical solution which is unique with anti-symmetric boundary data, then the gradient at the origin must be zero. Otherwise, you cannot get something different, right? So you can reflect. Uh, but the gradient cannot be zero um, because you prove that it's either um, <coughs> either constant or it has no zero gradient. So, so already in the 60s, he, he, he realized that you know the way the, what he was. The notion he was using was, was not general enough to solve the problem in, in even the unit ball. Um, so you can solve the, the Dirichlet problem, which Arnson also did, but not in full generality. Um, and the uniqueness was a hard question, uh, but it was solved by Janssen in '93. And after that, is all be, all <coughs> a lot of other proofs have been given. Uh, using different techniques, and um, should also mention here that um, if you if you take harmonic functions, of course, on the boundary you may have regular or irregular boundary points depending on um, the capacity or the measure of the complement around that point. But for the infinite Laplacian, all points, all boundary points are regular, so you can remove a point in the set, and then that will affect the solution. It will attain um, the boundary data. That um, so in 2001, it was proved this sort of line of implications that solutions are equivalent to this absolutely minimizing Lipschitz extensions. 
and that these are the same functions that minimize the L infinite normally gradient. Um, so one of these implications is sort of easy, but well, the other ones require a little bit more. What are the regularity conditions and the boundary for these results? So you, you can put continuous boundary data. Yeah, that's enough. No, no, but the boundary itself is moving. No, you don't need anything. So general <coughs> problem set. Um, so I mean, I think philosophically, if you take a P Laplace and when P is larger than M, then the natural space is W one P. And then I mean, the philosophically, you're always in in the Mori space, so you have actually global continuity somehow. So, yeah. Yeah, so one that is zero is absolutely minimizer. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it solves the equation. Okay. That's one way of You have some questions? Yeah, so in, that, in your example, all three have the same infinite number of gradient. Yes. So I don't understand that if and only if implication. No, but so absolutely minimizer extension extension um, means that it's a minimizer also here. Yeah, but, but the Lipschitz is not here. <laughs> What, what is the definition of solution? The, the left hand side. Oh, solutions. The infinite Laplace equation. Viscosity solutions. Yeah, yeah, viscosity solutions. Yes. Viscosity. Yeah. And minimize of the minimizers minimizer of the medium left. Right? Right? Local minimizer. Local. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it has to be a minimizer on any subset. So for instance, if you take the Lipschitz norm on this, it should be a minimizer of the Lipschitz norm zero. So it should be constant here. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's important that it's actually a minimizer of every subset. Okay, then it comes um, the question of regularity, which is hard to avoid uh, when you talk about the infinite Laplacian. So, so can I, can I just, just yes. really enjoy this absolute minimizing property. So again, you've got the boundary data G given in the original set omega. You take your <coughs> solution and you claim that the solution is the property and you look at any subset, I look at the boundary data and head yeah. from that solution yeah. and then compare the same problem for that, yeah. That's yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But of course, I mean, if you put the boundary data which is only continuous, it's not a Lipschitz extension sort of on the boundary because that function is not local. So locally, yes. Okay. So solutions. Um, the, the the regularity of solution is quite hard. So there are two big results. Um, so the first one was the C1 alpha regularity in the plane by Sabin and Evans in 2008. Uh, and then there's this peculiar result in any dimension which proves that solutions are differentiable. But no modulus of continuity or anything, and this is one of the few proofs of regularity of you know, solutions of PD I've seen where you only get differentiability and nothing more. Uh, so this, this is kind of interesting. Um, and boundary data on polarity sheets? No, so this, I mean, this is. The, the results I mentioned here are local regularity results. So you put anything on the boundary, as long as you can solve the equation, you get local regularity. There are a lot of boundary regularity results, and I think we even have an expert here in the audience uh, somewhere uh, on that. But yeah, I'm not mentioning, so this is just local regularity. In this language, you're saying local would be interior regularity. Yes, so yeah, so once you stay away from the boundary. How differentiability intersects with that example that you've shown? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, I mean, there's no problem here because it's a solution here, and here it's uh, analytic even. Here it's zero, so it's very regular. But these guys are not solutions. So, and it's not a solution at this point, but this is the boundary point. So, yeah. And also, there's a, there's sort of a some what you will call it from a free boundary point of view, flatness impli implies higher regularity result by Arnson, that if you have a C2 solution and that you have this, that this Hessian is now zero, then in fact it's just infinity. So uh, results are two Yes, they are listened to yeah. Um, but I mean, so it could be interesting, I've never thought about it, to, to try to, you know, see others, you know, can you cook up other conditions so in order to get high regularity, I, I don't know, I haven't thought about it, but uh, obviously not all solutions are T2, that's it. Um, okay, so, so a couple of examples that can be good to have in mind too. Uh, so cones of this form are solutions, as long as you stay away from, from the midpoint. 
Um, and then there is this famous example of Arlson. So x to the 4 over 3 minus y to the 4 over 3 if x and y are coordinates in the plane. So this is a viscosity solution, and you see that it's only C1 one third. So the gradient is continuous, color continuous with exponent one third. So, so at least, you know, regularity can't be better than that. Um, so that's what people believe is the optimal regularity. And also, if you take any solution of the aconal equation, so the equation with modulus of the gradient is constant, which is C1, that would be a solution. And uh, at least if you have a C2 solution, it's pretty easy to see uh, that you can express the infinite Laplacian in this way. So if this is constant, and you can actually make sense of this formula, well, it is a solution of the infinite Laplacian equation too. Uh, so, in particular, which is going to be important in, in the sequel, is that the distance function, and in a set, so the distance to the boundary, is a solution wherever it's C1. So then you can make a couple of examples. Um, so if you want, in the ball, in a unit ball, in fact, um, this function here is a solution um, outside the origin. <coughs> um, <coughs> and also, you can draw other examples. If you take, take a line, for instance, and then you take a stadium-like domain looking something like this. So you have like half balls here, half ball here, and flat then the distance function will be a solution here outside this set here which is usually referred to the high range uh, where it attains its maximum value so so it's, it's a solution of gamma is this, if gamma is this line um, okay so if in viscosity, why you exclude x not zero? Because when you but if it was a solution at the origin, it would be zero because the boundary data is zero. So it's not a solution at the origin. So like a comp mm -hmm. in one unit. So no differential. No, but no, no. It's not in viscosity sense. Okay. No, it's not. A, it's not a solution in viscosity sense even there because I mean then you would have then you have a unique solution with zero boundary data, so it would be zero. Um, Okay, so just a few references if you would like to read up on the infinite Laplacian. So there's these two original papers by Armstrong, 67 and uh, 66 and 67. Uh, I mean, he writes in a very nice way, and this is two days like classical analysis, but these are nice papers. Uh, and then you know, I'd suggest like two, two sort of overviews of the theory of the infinite Laplacian. So <coughs> one by Armstrong, Cranwell, and Utenham, and one by Wallingquist. So what is about singularities? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to mention maybe something in that direction, but yeah, not so much. It's, it's, it's hard. Um, uh, okay, so another interesting property um, is that if you look at the screen lines, and screen lines is very central in what I'm going to say and what follows. <coughs> and so if you take a solution and you take a screen line, x of t, and you look at the, what happens with the gradient along the screen lines of the solution. Well, you just compute this, and you see that this is just two times the infinity Laplacian at the point on the stream map. So it's zero if the solution is smooth. Otherwise, <coughs> it's not clear that you can make sense of this. So, so this is constant. Um, but this requires, of course, second-order derivatives to justify this. And you know, for a lot of PLEs, you have something that you can do for smooth solutions, and you say, well, you can always do some approximation, and this will be fine. But in fact, this will not be fine. So it's not true in general, as I was showing. Um, and another thing concerning um, string lines is that okay, string lines they solve this equation. So in general, you don't have any for this type of equation. So there are you know there are a few assumptions you can you can make. So for make so for instance, <coughs> if the gradient is Lipschitz. Then you can use the classical Picard-Lindlev theorem to say you have a unique solution. 
But if the gradient is Lipschitz, the solution is C11, which, in fact, is not true in general. Um, so another sufficient condition, you can relax this a little bit, is that you have a unique solution if u is semi-concave. And uh, I'm sure there are other people that can come up with other conditions, but this is a one, one little remark. There's an easy proof for this semi-concave. Um, so I will focus on ascending streamlines and descending streamlines. So, so the ascending ones, they go in the direction where the function increases. Descending ones are going down uh, with the values of u. And in fact, it turns out that in our setting, the ascending ones are going to be unique, while the descending ones are not going to be unique. Which became, I mean, we were trying to prove things, and we thought that we just need that these are unique, that they have to be unique, so we tried to prove that they're unique, but they're actually not unique. So, so that at least came as a little surprise to me. So, but if you look at that as a forward backward uniqueness, so forward, yeah, and yeah, yeah. And backward uniqueness, so there's a exactly, yeah. Right? So, I mean, yeah, depending on how you look at it, but in on one direction, mm -hmm. they are unique, but they can meet. So, some bifurcation if you want. But, but I mean, this holds also for the other ones, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see the I think, yeah. Um, so let me see. Did we? I think we. Yeah, at that point, you probably may not have uniqueness. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure actually. Yeah, I don't remember now. And just we have the uniqueness taken on the ascending concave before, but what are the weakest conditions you have for forward uniqueness? So you mean yeah. so the weakest condition we have to have uniqueness? The forward. So, so I mean, our setting is quite special, as I will come to. We're working in convex domains, actually in convex rings. So that's you know why you can actually guess that you should have some sort of that property like that. But then they are always unique. But in general, in a general set, um, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. No, it looks a little bit strange. I I agree. <laughs> because I mean, I would say that the gradient of minus u is the same as minus the gradient of u. So what it says actually is that minus u is not, if you look here, it's not semi-concave. That's true. So minus the gradient, minus u is not semi-concave. So oh, okay. semi-concavity was a condition? It's a sufficient condition. So if it was that, then you have uniqueness. If the <coughs> semi-concavity, I mean, I overlooked that, was required. No, I'm so saying that if you solve this equation and u is semi-concave, then you have a unique solution. For the next slide, was semi-concavity a condition? Yeah. No, no, no. But I'm saying, like, since you don't have uniqueness, this means that the function, so you don't have uniqueness with a minus sign, so it means that the function is not semi-convex. So otherwise you would have uniqueness. Saying it's a, it's a consequence of that. But, I mean, I'll show, I'll show you some examples. Um, you see. Okay, so, so let's go to the, the setup. So, so we're working in you know, some special assumptions. That's why we thought we could actually prove something. So you take a convex set, perhaps looks like this, and then you remove a point or a line. Let's say a line. So this is what they call gamma. This little line here, and this is the omega. So then we fix the solution, which is zero on the boundary, and it's one on this curve or this line in the middle. Okay? So that's the problem we're going to study. Um, so there are a couple of um, a couple of things that one should know that is true here. So there is a unique solution to this problem. Um, the boundary values are obtained in classical sense, solution. So we're looking in the plane here. We have to mention that, but it was on the slide. So the solution is C1 alpha, which is important for our investigation. So it minimizes, the solution here minimizes the, the Lipschitz norm or the gradient at infinity norm. So if here it's 1 on the boundary is 0. So the Lipschitz norm is going to be like 1 over the distance of this um, 
line to the boundary, right? Because the function <coughs> differs by one here. And one important thing here is that in this setup, the super level sets are convex. So this is a result which is very nice due to, to John Lewis. So he studied actually this problem more general. You have convex rings, but in particular it applies to this problem for the p-harmonic equations. And then he proved that the level sets, super level sets are convex. He proved other stuff as well, but this is one of the things. So, I mean, this already gives you some sort of structure to work with. Um, and here, oh, well, I'll come to that on that, another slide. So typical examples of this are actually the examples I've already mentioned. So if, if this gamma here is just a point, then of course, uh, and if you take a ball, so then this solution here, one minus absolute out of x, is a typical solution. Um, and also, if you have a stadium-like domain, which is like the one I drew here, um, the distance function in a domain like this, if the distance function is c1 everywhere outside is gamma, is a solution to this problem. And in fact, I'm going to say that these two examples are very, very special. Um, so I guess it's just some vocab um, some notion here. You usually <coughs> refer to this set then in this case as the higher reach, which is the set where the distance function has the maximum. Um, okay, so the result we have, I already talked about them a little bit. So the ascending gradient flow is unique and it will terminate at gamma, which of course you would believe you start at zero and then you go up to the maximum value of u. And the descending one are not unique, in general unique. Um, and <clears throat> we have also some sort of way of saying that the whole monotonicity of the gradient along the gra uh, string lines, if you have uniqueness, but not otherwise. Um, and I think Another interesting result that we can say is that, in fact, the only way that you have uniqueness of this descending gradient flow is if you are in either this position or in this position. If you perturb a little bit from those, you don't have uniqueness and you don't have semi-convexity of the solution, which I find kind of weird. So, I mean, in particular, this implies that if you look instead of the Instead of the infinity Laplace equation, um, you take something slightly different, perturb it a little bit, um, you y squared, you y, y. So if you look at this equation, so when delta is zero, this is just the infinite plus equation. And if you solve this in a ball, then for any positive delta, the solution is not semi-convex and you have non-uniqueness of this descending streamlines. But then in the limit, you have it. It's actually just this, this solution here. So it's some sort of uh, instability, which I find you not know, uh, interesting um, to see. Um, okay, how am I doing? 20 minutes left, maybe? Okay. So, so first, another thing I would like to mention, which is related to the result of Lewis. So I said that he proved that for this, if you solve this problem for p-harmonic equations, the, the, <coughs> the level sets are, su uh, the super level sets are convex. And in fact, you can use that, you can expand the operator to prove um, these kind of inequalities. So if you take the p-harmonic function, and you take the infinite self has operator of that, it's going to be a sub-solution. But if instead you take the problem we are looking at, so when p is infinity, so you have infinity harmonic function in this convex ring, uh, and you take any q equation, which is uh, between, let's say, 1 and infinity, then it's a super-solution. And this is crucial. And it's not true in general, but if you have, don't have a convex domain. No, not in general. I'm saying so. It could be. Um, so, but in general, you just take a line somewhere, and then you put the function to be one. There. I'm asking because it doesn't give you, I mean, your about uniqueness for the first eigenfunction of infinity. Uh, 
how would it give it uniqueness? Because, yeah, I, I mean, okay. I also have the feeling that if you solve this in certain yeah. domains, you will get the solution to the infinity eigenvalue problem that I cannot prove. Okay. Unless you're in a ball. Or a stadium. Uh, then I know that. Um, okay, so, so the only technicality I'm going to present is in fact this inequality here, which is, I mean, basically the only tool we, we use to prove things. So you integrate along a closed curve, uh, like a, a, along a boundary of an open set, where, where, where you are not uh, touching this gamma here. So it's an open set where it's a solution. And then this integral is, is non-negative. Okay, so <clears throat> if the solution was C2, then this would follow directly by just integrating by parts and using that this is a super solution uh, when it comes to the P of um, So it's not C2, and in general, some things are easy to say that you can just do by approximation, some things are not so easy. So I'm going to say a few details about how you prove this. Um, so, so the idea behind the proof of this is um, a very neat idea due to Vesa Yunin and Petri Jutinen, which they used um, to prove another, give another proof of uniqueness, no, the equivalence of solutions of weak and viscosity solutions of PL plus equation. Um, so, so what they did and what we do is we take two types of approximations. So first you take the infimal convolution. So you take the inf of these two quantities. And the good thing about the infimal convolution is that it preserves the super solution property. So it's still a super solution. And in fact, it's, um, it's semi-concave. Um, and after that, we take a standard modification uh, of this function. So the important thing they noticed here is that if you look carefully to the proof in, um, for instance, Evans Garetti's book of Alexandros, theorem, the, these Alexandrov second-order derivatives, which exist due to semi-concavity of this function, they converge almost everywhere. And this is a very crucial observation. And if you take some other approximations that don't, that, where you cannot play with this, I don't know how to do it. Um, okay, so, so they, convert, they conserve, they preserve the super solution property around semi-concave. So we have these two properties for this infimal convolution, still a super solution, and since the semi, due to the semi-concavity, we can estimate the p Laplacian of these functions from above. So then we can use FATU and the almost everywhere convergence, which is very crucial here, to pass to the limit uh, of these um, modifiers to say, in fact, if you take the limit of these guys, it's going to be, well, you just have to put the limit inside, and this is the epsilon thing, which, in fact, has the proper sign. Okay, so once you have done that, you have done the hard part, um, <coughs> because for the j's, you can integrate by parts. The j's, the, the function where you have modification, these are smooth. So you can just integrate by parts, and you get something for the epsilon, um, and it requires a little bit of work to pass the limit with epsilon, but, but I'm not going to bore you with those details. So the really crucial thing is that you have almost everywhere convergence of this Alexander derivative which I haven't seen really been used in this setting before. I, I saw that paper by Yulin and Yulin. Um, and I, was also, I should also say that this proof requires C1 estimates of the limiting solution. <coughs> so even if we had all the other tools available in higher dimensions, we couldn't, make it, couldn't do the proof here because you don't have the solutions in C1. Um, maybe you can do it in some other way. I don't know. Okay, but so this is the main inequality we're using. Okay, so how do we use it? Um, so how do we prove uniqueness of these three lines? So, so we take two three lines. Um, and suppose that they separate at the point. So suppose we have three mass looking like this. And that we have two points, y1 and y2. 
And down here, we will have a level set. Okay? But then, if we integrate this thing, where this is our D, let's see what happens. Well, here's a level set. So the gradient points like this. Well, the normal or the gradient. Then the gradient is parallel to the normal. Okay, but here, the normal points like this, and it's orthogonal to the gradient, right? Because, well, that's just how you, how you define it. Um, so, the integral here and the integral here will be zero. So what is left is just the integral over here. But we have a sign. Um, so this means that this is in fact zero. And I had it on a slide, but I didn't emphasize it. But we know that the gradient is always non-zero in this setting. So this is a contradiction. So we know that this, in fact, cannot happen due to this. OK. So <clears throat> the only property we have, if you want, you can call it a device for detecting when you have three lines that meet. So suppose you have a point on this high level set, gamma, where basically the gradient here is larger than the gradient somewhere here. Then if you start somewhere near those, that point on the boundary and go up here, in the neighborhood of this point, it must be, there must be three lines that meet, in fact, at some point. So in other words, you can say it like this. If the gradient doesn't meet, then you have that the gradient is not increasing along three lines. Um, in some sense, this is, this is what it means. So, how do we prove this? Well, like I said to someone in the break, that basically this is just first year calculus. So suppose <coughs> that there are no streamlines meeting. So you have a point here. So where did we start? Um, so I have x1 here, x2 here. And we go up, okay, now I'm drawing a very straight picture, but suppose it looks like this. Here's a level set, and here's a level set. Okay, but then you make the same conclusion that the gradient is orthogonal to the normal on these sides, and parallel to the normal on these sides. So what you will get, um, in fact, from, from integrating this inequality, is that the integral from x1 to x2 uh, of the gradient p minus 1 is larger than the integral from y1 to one y2. OK? But then you say, this is true for all p. So you have some p to infinity. So what you would get, in fact, is that the gradient on the higher level set is less than the gradient on the lower. So basically, this means you have monotonicity, in fact, if, if they do not meet. But if they meet, I mean, you can't really do that argument, right? Um, OK. So another important thing I will just mention, I will not talk so much about it, is that, in fact, in this setting here, it's re I mean, it seems very reasonable to believe that the maximum the gradient is attained at this set gamma. And this is indeed true. So, so you can prove that when you approach this set gamma, this is where the gradient will attain its maximum, and that will be 1 over the distance from gamma to the boundary, because that's the Lipschitz normal of the, uh, of the boundary data. So, so this is just due, in fact, to, to an expansion of infinity harmonic functions um, around in puncture domain, let's say, in 2D. So they prove that, in fact, you can always expand a function as a constant plus a cone-like um, function and a lower order term with the slope of this cone being the maximum of the gradient. So that means that the tangent domain should always have the maximum gradient attained there. And this proof also requires C1 estimates. So it only works in the plane, as far as I know. OK, um, so why? Do I want to use this? Well, so now I want to talk about this rigidity results. That if you don't, if you have a ball and perturb it a little bit, 
then you will lose this uniqueness. So let's take a ball game. We already have one here. Okay, and suppose that we are not in a ball. So we have something which is convex, but not really, in, oh, that was really close to a ball. <coughs> something like this. That looks like a ball too, but okay. <laughs> so we know that at this middle point here, this is gamma. Here the max is the maximum value of the gradient, or at least in the limit sense. Okay, so if, if we are not in the ball, then there is a point here, and this is not in the ball, uh, which has larger distance um, to this point than 1. Um, okay, but then if you move from here to here, at some point the gradient has to go below 1, because otherwise the function will decrease too much. So if it goes below 1 somewhere, let's say here, Um, then we are accepting that at this point here, the gradient is less than 1, but here the gradient is larger, it is equal to 1, or at least in the limit. So then we are accepting on what I just discussed earlier, that you go from something lower to something larger. And this is only possible if you have an intersection of the string lines. And in fact, you can, yeah, you can make a very similar proof in domains like look like perturbation of these two. Um, sort of similar argument, just requires some other considerations. Yeah, so this is what I said. Um, <clears throat> so how is time? Yeah, I'll say it. Only a few minutes, I guess. So, so let's go to the, to the square. So suppose we're in the square. And you take the midpoint to be gamma. So it's 0 here, 0 here, 0 here, 0, and 1 in the middle. OK, so <clears throat> if you make all the reflections here, 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 and here, and then continue to do all the reflections, in fact, you can assume that you have solutions around the corner points, and then the gradient must be 0, because it's 0 on um, two directions there. So, so in this setting, in fact, the gradient is 0 here, here, and here. And what you can do, as an easy observation, is also to compare the solution. Um, you put the ball inside, and then you take the distance function in the ball, which is just this function to the left here, if it's a unit ball. And the distance function, <coughs> well, if you look at the boundary data, you can compare it with the solution itself. So it's going to be less than the solution in the square. Uh, but if you take the distance function instead in the square, this is always a super solution. I didn't say that, but it's a, the distance function is always a super solution. So this will lie above uh, our function. Uh, so this means, in fact, since these two functions, they will coincide here, 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 and here. So which means that we know on the medians these two functions and thus these three functions will coincide. So we know what it looks like on the medians. Um, so since I don't have so much time, let me just say what we can what we can argue for in the square. So first of all, there's a unique streamline going from the point to the midpoint, and we can actually prove that on the diagonals gradient is not decreasing because diagonals are streamlines. And then we can prove that there are infinitely many meeting points near the origin, near the corners. And what is the last sign? Um, yes, that along any string line except the medians. But the medians, they just go straight to the middle. So along any other string line, there are infinitely many points where you have bifurcation. So, I mean, that, this is not what I would expect if you say that I'll solve the problem in the square. Um, and and this, with, with the tools I presented, this, these are just a few for rows to argue for that. So, yeah, let me just finish with giving you the picture in the square. So you see that all the screen lines, they go to the diagonals. 
except the medians that it goes straight there. And then, so you have infinitely many points uh, here, and here you have nothing. So, I mean, you would guess that maybe the gradient is, I don't know, what this looks like. Is that the ridge, high ridge? Yeah. No, these are the stream maps. No, no, the, the cross. So the high ridge is this, this is the maximum. Okay. But what people call the ridge, uh, so which is where the distance function is not differentiable, these are the diagonals. So it seems like, you know, this set plays an important role, but it's not so easy to see in general. Uh, and here, yeah, here you see what the, uh, what the level set and the directions look like. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't have guessed this picture from the beginning. Get that question. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Could I maybe just ask you on the very last picture, you have this on the left uh, left picture there, you have this kind of straight lines going to the diagonal and then they kind of do some bending to go along the diagonal. Yeah. Do you have any idea where the length scale of this bending comes from? Or I don't know. I mean, basically what I know is what I listed on the last slide. So, um, yeah, just to show that even in the square, I, I don't know. So, is this crossing lines uh, the singular sets of the solution? Um, yes. Uh, let's see. Do we know it's a singular set? Yes, probably. It cannot be C2 at least there. So, what's yeah. the uh, singularity there? Order? 4 over 3? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, but as, of course it cannot. Well, maybe it can. I, I don't know if we even have a proof that it's not C two here. But uh, well, if, no, it cannot be because then the gradient will be constant. So yeah, it's not C two. But um, yeah, no, I, I cannot say anything about the regular. Not the, not even here where I'm actually guessing it's smooth. But you know. So what are the bound? This is zero boundary condition. Yeah, so zero on the boundary one. and one in the middle. Yeah. So why don't you have just a pyramid solution? The, um, we just have four planes. So that would be the dis I mean the distance function, yes. but it's not the I mean the, we know that the solution is C one here, but the distance function is not C one, so it cannot be the distance function. But it's I mean it looks fair if you plot it. I have a plot of it, but it looks fairly similar to the distance function, but it's still I mean it's curved. So, so this question about the the uh, regularity of the the uh, seven uh, errors yeah. C one alpha, and then you have this example with the four third. Yeah. But that was a singularity on the boundary, or was it? But the singularity at the origin. It, it, but it's the boundary, boundary point. point. No, no, it's a solution there. Yeah. It's it's a I don't understand this expansion you have with one. Uh, no, but so this is in the puncture domain. So but you have a solution with with one point removed. The one, uh, or which so, one okay. So solve so an equation in in uh, B one minus the origin. Yeah. Yeah. Then this is the expansion around the origin. And his example, it's a solution also at origin. So if I have a solution in the full ball and I remove a point, it's not a solution anymore. Well, I mean, you don't have a solution in the full ball. You take the ball, you remove a point, then you take a solution. Yeah, but that means the expansion is even more general, so it should apply to this 4 third example. No. I mean, the, the example is a solution in the full ball. But the other one is just a solution in the more minus set. Ah, so you're assuming something about uh, some global... I'm assuming that there's a, you know, a isolated singularity. So basically you can make no, a compound. Yeah, yeah. If I have a solution, I have a solution. No, no, you don't start, okay. But you don't take a solution in the football. You take a solution in the ball minus the, 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 the set. The arrow is an example in the solution in the football. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's okay. But uh, so either, a solution either, solution either is the differentiability and a solution oh. everywhere, or it's an isolated singularity. Well, it does satisfy the same boundary condition. And okay, so, so maybe I phrased it on my slide vaguely. So either it's it's a removable singularity, and then you get yeah. this, or you have a comb. Okay. I mean, so but um, this is supposed to be the case where you have an isolated singularity, okay. which is not removable. Okay. So I mean, it's just yes. Yeah.
But yeah, yeah. yeah. It's also not semi-convex, right? No. The other, the other example. Uh, no, probably not. It doesn't no. seem to fit it, you know. Okay. So I want to combine this question with the land scale. So again, the domain that you have is all the one. So imagine it's in a larger domain. Yeah. Is, is, is this a transition with something you've looked at? Because is this a beyond all orders match asymptotics? Basically, it's the pyramid solution you know, describing, and then you, on a very tight boundary layer, introduce these special solutions to give you smoothness? Oh, you mean when I sold? So we just did the analytical structure. So again, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing this in some sort of regular analysis. Yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but I'm not sure I got the question though. Yeah, I mean, we can maybe take it up. For this case, it's the first time you're partial. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the reasons we started the problem. But yeah. Okay, one last question. to time reversal symmetry. If u is an infinity harmonic, minus u is also. Yes, but I mean, the set thing we have. Ah! It's not it's not symmetric, right? Because it's one here and zero here. You take minus u, reverse the order where the function increases and decreases. Okay. So when you spoke about absence of uniqueness, there was a feeling that something was not said in your settings. Some point was missing. Um, so it's, it's, it's I was thought, so that everything the results I'm talking about is in this situation. Yeah, okay, that's uh, so it's not it's not the Aronson. No, 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 sure. The Aronson doesn't I mean, have any uniqueness, in, forward or backward. No, I mean, even in any domain, I mean, I cannot prove anything. So it's ridiculous to talk about complex domains <laughs> because then you have complex level sets, so you can actually work a little bit. So, yeah, but you make an assumption on the sign of the boundary value. Of course, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's the strong assumption here, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So if there are no further questions, then I'd like, I'd like to thank everyone. all speakers and participants for participating in this workshop. And it was really nice to have that you there. So uh, maybe we can have some further discussion. Yeah. So thank you all. So maybe we should also seize the opportunity to thank the organizer of this wonderful workshop. Yeah. Yeah.